Panel 1 focused on Caribbean economic growth and trade with Canada and featured presentations by Ambassador Dr. Richard Bernal, Professor of Practice and Pro-Vice-Chancellor for Global Affairs at the UWI, and Dr. Donald Sir, Professor of the Goodman School of Business at Brock University. The panel was moderated by Dr. Indiana Mintokoy, Senior Research Fellow at the UWI. I am Indiana Mintokoy. I am Senior Research Fellow at the Mona School of Business and Management, and I'm also the Academic Director for the Master's Programs at the Business School. This morning, we have two very, I say, illustrious men to present to us, and you'll know what I mean when I go into the CVs and the introduction. So our first speaker this morning will be Ambassador Richard Bernal. And in short, Ambassador Bernal is a man with much education, much experience, many titles. In short, Ambassador Dr. Richard Bernal is Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs here at the University of the West Indies. He was educated at the University of the West Indies, University of Pennsylvania, as well as Johns Hopkins University. Ambassador Bernal has had an illustrious career as a member of the Board of Directors of the Inter-American Development Bank, as the Chief trade negotiator at the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and as the Director General of the Caribbean Regional Negotiating Machinery. He's also served as Jamaica's ambassador to the United States and permanent representative to the Organization of American States for 10 and a half years. He's worked as the CEO of a commercial bank. He's worked at the Bank of Jamaica, the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and the Ministry of Finance. Professor Bernal has published over 100 articles in scholarly journals, books and monographs, and opinion pieces. He has given testimonies to several committees of Congress and the US International Trade Commission on issues of concern to the Caribbean, and has been quoted by and appeared on many well-known newspapers and new news networks, including the Financial Times, Washington Post, and in recognition of our partners here today, he's also appeared on the CBC. Our second speaker, Professor Don Sear, has been with the Goodman School of Business since 1995, where he teaches in corporate finance, international finance, and investments. Among his many qualifications are his PhD in finance from the University of Alberta, and in the spirit of multidisciplinarity, he has a BSc in geology from Concordia University. Before his career as an academic, an interesting point, Don worked as a uranium exploration geologist and as a financial analyst at Shell Canada. Prof. Sear has served the Goodman School of Business well, including as Dean from 2013 to 2015 and Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Research from 2002 to 2009. So ladies and gentlemen, you'll understand that the two speakers here are well qualified to speak to us, right? And so I want you to uh, join with me in welcoming them. And our first speaker will be Ambassador Bernal, who will address us on Canada CARICOM trade and investment. Time for an upgrade. Thank you, Madam Chair for that, if I can borrow your word, illustrious introduction. You may have raised expectations beyond my capacity. Nevertheless, happy to be here and to lead off. Somebody has to go first in these things. <laughs> I want to share some thoughts with you about trade and investment between Canada and the Caribbean. And the reason I want to do that is because, as I said, in, in the opening ceremony. The relationship between Canada and the Caribbean has been so good, strong, friendly. Canada has been so empathetic and supportive that the relationship has become comfortable and even complacent. And therefore, a lot of unrealized potential exists 
And therefore, one of the things we want to do with the Institute is to use this to reinvigorate the relationship with some new ideas and to point to some unexplored opportunities. And trade and investment is emblematic of this comfortable, complacent relationship. First of all, the trade. Trade goes back into the 18th century. Codfish coming to the Caribbean, rum and sugar going to Canada. That relationship was so strong that it actually had an important development effect on the Canadian banking system. Some of Canada's largest banks made their developmental spurt off the trade with the Caribbean. Indeed, these Canadian banks formed the backbone of the commercial banking system in the Caribbean from the 1890s down into maybe the 70s. Indeed, at one time, the governments in the region, before they became independent countries, the governments banked with the Bank of Nova Scotia. There was no central bank. And they have been a fundamental part of the banking system. Very important to the region, and they have remained consistently engaged in the region. In terms of trade, Canada has always had a benevolent approach to the trade. Going back into the 1920s, Canada started to provide preferential trade arrangements to the Caribbean, first for sugar and then more generally. This eventually culminated in the mid-1980s with Carib Can, which was a one-way preferential trade arrangement. Change arrangement. Unfortunately, that arrangement did not include all the commodities, but it has been the framework of trade between Canada and the CARICOM, at least, for a long time. One of the indications of the need to revisit this is, in spite of this preferential trade arrangement, the exports from the Caribbean to Canada have actually declined, goods exports. And the imports from Canada have grown, but not rapidly, nothing to compare with the growth from imports from China, etc. So you have had a persistent trade balance. Now, we understand that most of the countries in the region, at least in CARICOM, are not so much goods oriented, but more services oriented, financial services, tourism, etc. But still, it's a worrying sign if trade declines. So this is the first indicator that something needs to be done about trade. Why? Canada has a range of products, not confined to goods. Um, the Caribbean imports a lot of goods, and their imports have grown steadily. But Canadian imports from Canada have not kept pace with the overall pace of import growth. So, in about 2000 and, well, in the mid-1990s, and I'm the culprit here because I suggested it, there was a move to upgrade Caribcan into a trade agreement. Canada referred to it as a free trade agreement, and we in the CARICOM referred to it as a development partnership. Nevertheless, there was an agreement, and that agreement was that this would upgrade CARIBCAN by expanding the coverage, not only in the number of commodities covered, but would expand it to include not just goods trade, but trade in services, investment, intellectual property rights, etc., in the style of a modern comprehensive free trade agreement. The idea of my suggesting it was, it would be an agreement in which Canada would provide some preferential treatment to the small developing economies of the Caribbean. And that this would become a model 
which could be applied in the free trade area of the Americas, which eventually never materialized, and in the WTO. The negotiations started in 2001, and uh, they stopped in a few years ago. After eight rounds of negotiations, I believe it would be no exaggeration to say that the Canadians were getting a little exasperated about the pace. And even a large country like Canada does not have unlimited trade negotiating capacity. And there were other countries that aggressively wanted to conclude trade agreements. So it was decided to put it on pause. It's not dead, but nothing has happened recently. And usually what happens is whenever the Prime Minister of Canada visits the region, the prospect of a trade agreement is usually raised. Um, this was raised some years ago and given a lot of momentum, didn't materialize. But I suspect that just about this time, I believe the Canadian government will raise the issue again. And uh, given the fact that nothing is happening in the WTO, and that CARICOM is not currently negotiating anything else. I see no reason why this should not become a priority because there is potential and there is interest on both sides. And I think it's something that needs to go ahead. Now, in going ahead, it not only has to expand the range of goods included, it has to now include services because the CARICOM countries are service exporting countries. It needs to take in investment because that's closely related to trade. And it needs also to look at intellectual property rights and other critical issues, critical to the Caribbean more so than Canada because entertainment and cultural exports have become very important in the region and have considerable potential. I want to raise, as I'm wearing my academic hat here, so I'm free to raise all kind of unusual ideas. I want to reiterate something I said many years ago, which is that Canada is still a country which receives migrants as the economy has grown and the country grows, and a lot of Caribbean migrants have taken advantage of this. If we look at the potential based on empirical studies, of trade between Canada and the Caribbean. They all indicate that trade from Canada will grow more than trade from the Caribbean. So if the jobs from a free trade agreement between Canada and CARICOM are going to accrue mainly in Canada, I would propose that the agreement include a quota for the movement of labor. In other words, if the jobs are occurring mostly over there, then if we're to benefit, then maybe we have to go to where the jobs are. So that's something new, but I believe it's something that's going to come in the future, that future trade agreements will not only include labor standards, but the movement of labor. On the investment side, Canada was a very important source of investment some years ago, not only in the financial sector, but also in the mineral sector, in bauxite and other minerals. Those companies have since restructured and reorganized and withdrawn from the region, but they came into the region in the 50s and 60s at a critical time when Jamaica was actually the world's leading producer of bauxite, but they were also engaged in Guyana, etc. I believe that the slowdown we have seen in Canadian investment is because we in the Caribbean here have not presented to Canadian investors to the extent that we market investment opportunities in the US and China and elsewhere. We haven't paid as much attention to marketing investment opportunities in Canada because these opportunities are numerous. There are opportunities in energy, clean energy, traditional energy. 
There are opportunities in infrastructure. I haven't seen any Canadian firms bidding on major infrastructure projects. Um, there is considerable opportunity in tourism. We receive, the region receives over 2 million um, Canadian tourists. And I say the region now, not just CARICOM, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, et cetera. So there is a demand for it, but I haven't seen the Canadian investment in hotels, etc. There is enormous potential in entertainment, healthcare, and education, and I mention them in the same breath. Why? Canada still imports nurses. The demand for nurses will continue to grow. There is a possibility for private sector investment to provide training for nurses here on the understanding that a certain number of those trained would go to Canada and a certain number would stay here. It doesn't have to be done by government. This is a private sector opportunity. After all, Canada imports doctors trained in private universities in the Caribbean and in public universities such as the University of the West Indies. So here is a, another investment opportunity with enormous potential. What I think needs to be done here is to give some priority to this, include it in a new trade agreement, look at the bilateral investment treaty route, the dual taxation route, make sure that these agreements are up to date and also put more of an emphasis in marketing, tourism and investment in Canada. We tend to be US focused, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be North American focused, and there are opportunities there. I would include in investment, public investment. Canada has been a critically important source of development aid, and I would include that as public investment. Earlier today, the Vice Chancellor spoke about the investments in this university, building student facilities and teaching facilities at Mona, St. Augustine, Cave Hill, and the open campus. There are therefore opportunities which Canada has enabled the Caribbean to fulfill. Canadian aid has been of enormous importance in Haiti. Canada has now moved into areas which are a vital concern to us, such as crisis management, climate-related activities, and there are opportunities there even for private investment. So Canadian aid, which has been so consistent, so reliable, and so empathetic, is likely to continue, but it is now morphing into new areas, areas which are of considerable um, importance to the Caribbean region. I would include on the investment as well, remittances. We have a very large Caribbean population in Canada, mainly in Ontario. In fact, it is said by some that it is the largest overseas population of Jamaicans. I don't know how right that is, because there's New York and there's Miami, but it's very important. The remittances that are sent there are not only a social cushion and shock absorber, they are a vital source of investment. Much of the construction boom that's going on now is responding to inflows of remittances. Remittances also have been a vital source of helping to make Jamaica's stock exchange the fastest growing in the world. So there is another area of investment. I include on the investment, private investment, public investment, and remittances. My basic message is there is enormous untapped potential in trade and investment. And it is now time to put in place the incentives, the arrangements, the attention to galvanize this enormous potential. I leave you by saying that Canada has been almost unique in the fact that it has grown 
consistently, even during the global financial crisis. I can think of no better partner for the region than a developed country with resources, empathy, and with the opportunities which are there. And I think that Canada as a consistently growing economy would be an ideal partner for us. Thank you. And, uh, I'm going to be talking about what is um, an important uh, issue. It's uh, socially, economically, and and politically sensitive in uh, in some areas, um, but it is growing. It's an issue that's growing quite quickly, and the issue, of course, is around uh, the use of tax havens. Um, and the use of tax havens is um, something that, uh, there's two elements to it. And uh, one, of course, is uh, referred to as tax evasion. The other one is referred to as tax avoidance. I know when I'm running from something, whether I'm, an avo I'm avoiding it or evading it, I'm not too sure of the, of the difference. But uh, there are issues uh, in terms of tax avoidance which have come recently to the attention of uh, uh, peoples in many society. And so it brings about uh, you know, the, the question of the impact of it. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, what's called uh, multinational transfer mechanisms. Uh, how multinationals transfer funds between, uh, let's say, a parent company and its satellite uh, operations, sometimes known as special purpose vehicles. And that separates them from uh, simply an independent firm. The major techniques, so this is going to be a, a quick crash course in this, uh, transfer pricing, leading and lagging, uh, some use of dividends, and uh, probably more importantly, intercompany loans, also known as earnings uh, strippings, uh, stripping. The, um, I'm going to talk about mainly about transfer pricing, and uh, that's the examples that I'll, I'll, I'll probably uh, emphasize the most. Um, I have the dubious task of teaching these techniques uh, when I teach international finance uh, for MBAs and uh, and upper level undergraduate students. Uh, and uh, there are methods by which a major corporation can avoid taxes. And uh, this has been brought to the attention of the public recently uh, in a number of ways. Um, Starbucks, for example, uh, very rarely pays federal tax in either uh, Canada, the US, or the UK. And uh, that is done uh, by using a Swiss uh, subsidiary in which the brand rights uh, to the name of Starbucks is charged to the uh, satellite operations in North America or the UK at a very high price, which then makes their taxable income look very low, so they don't pay any taxes. Uh, so the profits are shifted to Switzerland and then down to tax havens from there untaxed. The double Irish with a Dutch sandwich, all of these techniques have some very interesting names. I'm, I'm looking for my uh, former uh, uh, international tax advisor from Ryerson. He can probably fill us in on some of these. Uh, this is a technique, an interesting one used by... Um, uh, largely internet companies, high-tech companies such as Google, Apple, and Microsoft. Same kind of idea in the sense of the assignment of intellectual property, in this case, uh, is assigned uh, to Irish firms with very low uh, tax applying. Two Irish companies used, one for uh, the goods that are sold in North America, another one for goods that are sold in Europe, and these operations are, are charged with very high um, IP charges, so again, their taxable income looks very low. In the case of Europe, the twists and turns of the legal aspects are such that 
that money is then transferred to a subsidiary in uh, the Netherlands and then back to the first Irish company, the double Irish with a Dutch sandwich, and then moved to tax havens from there, effectively paying no price anywhere. This came to uh, attention in 2014. 2015, the uh, Irish uh, finance minister passed some laws to uh, change uh, the Irish legal loopholes that create this, but firms are still offered until to continue this until this year, 2020. Um, the IMF has estimated that profit shifting by multinational corporations cost developed countries over 500 billion a year. That's almost 4% of their national income. But what is more disconcerting is the 200 billion estimated on developing countries. The share of their gross national product is much, much higher that is due to profit shifting techniques that ultimately result in those firms not paying any tax at all in those countries and therefore uh, them not benefiting from it. It's believed that possibly over US, 40 trillion of untaxed funds resides in tax havens. There are over 60 tax havens, 64 approximately identified. Uh, there have been now many different lists of these tax havens rating them. Uh, the uh, European Union, of course, in 2017 has now began to put greater attention upon tax havens, of which the Caribbean is one uh, which is now under, uh, under a light uh, uh, from them. Um, Oxfam as well. And uh, basically they benefit from little or no tax and high banking secrecy rules. And that's the issue. A lot of this is brought to light through the work of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which resulted in a number of uh, leaks that, um, that uh, you know, I'm not technically savvy. International Consortium of Investigative Journalists a U.S.-based nonprofit that uh, has about 249 investigative reporters that have been on to this topic in more recent years. They have a, an amazing searchable database where uh, you can go in there, put in the name of a corporation or an individual, and it leads from all it it gives from all the possible leaks that have uh, come out of various uh, law firms and accounting firms on transactions in terms of uh, tax havens and gives you all the connections. You can put any name in there and uh, this is all publicly uh, available. History of the leaks, dating back to 2013, 2014, the Lux leaks, Swiss leaks, 2015, the football leaks, 2016, 18. Um, of course, the, the ones that we're probably the most familiar with from a general perspective is the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. The uh, Paradise Papers were probably the most significant in what we're talking about in terms of multinational transfer mechanisms because they tended to provide more information about corporations and their uh, dealings in terms of uh, tax havens. Panama paper, uh, a lot more about uh, individuals. That was the uh, law firm uh, Mossack Fonseca. Appleby was the uh, corporate service provider which uh, information was leaked. 13.4 million confidential electronic documents uh, that became the Paradise Papers here in 2017. Uh, this um, this summer, the Mauritius leaks, 200,000 documents from a law firm revealed the multinational companies used Mauritius to avoid taxes in many developing uh, countries. Uh, Mauritius had established tax treaties with uh, these developing countries 
and uh, Senegal in particular, one of the world's poorest with half the population living in poverty. January 2019, Mauritius changed some of its tax laws in an attempt to mitigate what was coming out as a leak this past summer. Some Canadian connections there, uh, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has not responded yet to uh, a request for information on a mining operation uh, that they purchase in which untaxed revenues uh, flow to Mauritius. Canadian corporations invested over 2.5 billion in Mauritius in 2018, representing over 35% of total direct investment by Canadian corporations in all of Africa, while Mauritius just represents 0.1% of the total population of Africa, one, less than 1% of the gross domestic product, and its territory is smaller than the city of Ottawa. One of, the re, one of the ways that governments are realizing the extent of what is now being called the tax gap is the amount of foreign direct investment put into a country relative to its population or gross uh, national product. That is becoming an important signal of what is actually, actually happening in this complex world of multinational uh, corporations. Most of these leaks are anonymous uh, leaks. Uh, it's not without some uh, danger. 2017, one of the reporters of, uh, associated with the, uh, uh, with the independent uh, uh, journals uh, was uh, killed in a car bomb in Malta, uh, triggered by a cell phone text to her car from a ship out sea, she was investigating activity between the Maltese, with respect to Maltese Prime Minister and uh, the ruling family of Azerbaijan. Uh, that's her car there after the uh, bombing. So obviously there is a lot of secrecy and issues with regards to all of this. And now in the past uh, couple of years, we've seen a number of movies that have come out with regards to this issue. The issue is rising in the mind of the general public. Uh, the Panama Papers 2018 and this past year, The Laundromat, the Netflix movie starring uh, Gary Oldman, Antonio Banderas and Meryl Streep address the issue. Although I would say if there's, and so to some extent I've designed a lot of this presentation for the researchers in the room that see this as something to look at there's a lot of various web links in there to connect to if you want to gather further information on the topic um the laundromat is not really i feel is a movie the best explanation particularly at the multinational corporation side and if you would really uh, like to have an interesting understanding of things you can uh, turn to uh this uh, uh tax edition an online game where you can, you pick your company worldwide, you pick a financial tax advising firm, and then you move earnings around the world. You have on the, on the online game, uh, all of the tax treaties, Canada by, uh, by the way has the most tax treaties of any country, and, uh, and you also have the different corporate forms that these companies have, which is an important issue. And then you, the purpose of the game is for you to move earnings around the world uh, so that you minimize uh, taxes. An interesting uh, uh, learning experience. Um, the McGill University tax law professor, Allison Christensen, uh, there again is a link uh, of value to you. She has some great uh, information there on the whole issue. Well, how has Canada fared in the leaks? Well, uh, in terms of the Panama leaks, there was a lot of uh, CBC reported on a lot of high profile individuals that often that use uh, tax, uh, tax havens to avoid taxes. Um, the uh, Mossack Fonseca and Appleby, it's important to realize, are just two of a number of firms that exist that facilitate uh, tax avoidance and, in some cases, tax evasion. 
Canadian firms uh, list in the Paradise Papers employing tax haven strategies, again reported uh, by the uh, consortium. Canada's top 60 public companies have over 1,000 tax haven subsidiaries or related uh, companies, meaning that these are all part of their operations, and yet, uh, such as in the case of uh, Walmart in Switzerland with uh, six companies there, although no operations in Switzerland. Canada's government, different estimates in the past year or so, uh, loses between 10 billion and 15 billion annually due to corporate, this is their words of uh, Canadians for Tax Fairness, tax dodging using tax havens. Six billion dollars would pay for 200,000 new child care spaces, 4,600 affordable housing units, 1,000 MRI machines, 650 new water treatment plants, and uh, 18 Super Hornet fighter jets. That would be in one year. That's, that's for six billion dollars. The issue is that it looks like it's worse than that. The Office of the Parliamentary Budget Officer in June 2019 finally came out with a tax gap report to being requested back in 2012. Part of the tax gap can be attributed to tax evasion. Uh, part of it due to tax avoidance, which includes actions that reduce the amount of taxes paid through legal means, but contravene the object and spirit of the law. The PBO study, using different methodologies, estimates the tax loss could be as high as $25 billion annually. The federal deficit for Canada was $19 billion in 2017-18. Uh, Canada Revenue Agency has not, as of yet, published a comprehensive tax gap study, although that is done regularly in the U.S. and Australia. Canada is a facilitator of tax avoidance. One of the things that came out of the uh, Paradise Papers and the Appleby Law Firm was the extent by which Canada has, through its legal structures, facilitated tax avoidance. Known in the industry as snow washing. A, you know, a nice, safe country with a good reputation where if we can transfer earnings there and then move them out to tax havens, doesn't seem to uh, attract as much attention. So much so that Appleby was getting ready to set up an office in Halifax because of the growing uh, use of these uh, issues. That's done through something we call a limited partnership. I can set up a company in Canada. It can be owned by limited partners, which may be numbered companies and tax havens. I can transfer income to that limited partnership. It is not taxed in Canada. It's attributed to the limited partnerships they will be taxed that in the in the case in the company with which is uh, considered a tax haven where it will be not taxed all those all those limited partners may actually be owned by the company that transfers money to the limited partnership so uh, residents in different countries are becoming quite angry with this due to political pressure of course the OECD IMF, European Union, of course, is uh, starting to bring some pressure on this. Uh, I won't get into our own Canada Revenue Agency. I don't have too much time, although I will tell you this one, because this is a great example of transfer pricing at work. And I know my international tax consultant is going to agree with me with this. This is a company I used to work for, Uranium Exploration Company, uh, pretty much the largest in the world uh, in Saskatchewan, produces uranium. Taken to court by Canada Revenue Agency for because for many years what they've been doing is selling uranium at $10 a pound to their Swiss subsidiary, which then sells it worldwide for $140 a pound. Now in transfer pricing, this should be an easy case. You have a commodity, you have a world price, you have 
your production price and then a reasonable markup, this should be an easy case to win. But our tax agency in Canada is very much outnumbered, outgunned legally. Uh, September 2018, they lose the case. They are appealing. And then we had to pay Cameco $10 million in legal costs as well. Our revenue, our Canada revenue agency is uh, uh, very much outgunned compared to the U.S. IRS, which is makes us another another issue as to why you know we are increasingly being seen as a as a tax uh, haven. Um, Canada public perception: ninety percent of Canadians think that the use of tax havens by large corporations to avoid paying taxes is morally wrong. Canada of course, has uh, been very much, as we've noted, involved with the Caribbean. In fact, our banks, uh, RBC 1882, Scotia Bank 1889, as my colleague suggested, they were very much the start of the banking industry, mainly around trade, CIBC and Barbados, 1920. 1950s and 60s, uh, former governor of the Bank of Canada, most probably helped make Jamaica into a reduced taxation country in the 1960s. Bahamas were becoming a tax haven. Um, uh, good work on this uh, uh, by a sociologist at uh, McGill, Alan Deneau, Canada New Tax Haven. We've certainly had a very uh, much a connected uh, impact for the Caribbean. But now, in current day, we see several Canadian banks that are, are um, uh, disengaging. Uh, they are starting to sell off some operations. And that's a concern, a great concern for the Caribbean. Um, many uh, local Caribbean banks don't have the uh, asset level to maintain what's called correspondent accounts. And they're, uh, okay, what does that mean? Time. She's saying, do you, give me, do you give me more time? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm finishing up. Okay. Um, <laughs> rising income inequality. I won't go through all of that. What is happening here in the world? Uh, why the funds are not being reinvested in productive assets? Uh, the richest 10% of Americans now own 85% of all stocks. So when share repurchases with these funds are, when they are repatriated, it's not benefiting a lot. Growth of populism and, and anti-globalization. And then a uh, couple of research ideas. We need a better history of this. We also need to know the impact from a socioeconomic perspective. Finally, I'll leave you with these words. And that's the anonymous leaker of the Panama Papers issued a statement in May 2016. Historians can easily recount how issues involving taxation and balances of power have led to revolution. Military was necessary to subjugate people, whereas now curtailing information access is just as effective since the act is often invisible. And then I've got a very dour looking end uh, picture here for us. Thank you.